sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Now, I know what you're thinking. Holly, what the flaming heck is that? Well, today my job is to explain this concept to you in the most simplistic way possible, what's being said about it in various social media circles and what this means for your own training. Hey guys, Holly here. Welcome back to my channel. And today we're digging into one of the most widely misunderstood topics in hypertrophy research, and that is sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Now, you may have heard claims that certain types of training inflate the muscle with various types of non contractile components like fluid or enzymes rather than building contractile proteins that are responsible for producing force. And that idea really took off after a 2019 paper which suggested that six weeks of extremely high volume training produced muscle fiber growth that was largely sarcoplasmic and not myofibrillar. But the story behind these findings is a little bit more complicated and in my opinion much more interesting than the headlines suggest. Now just for a quick review before we get into to all the details, the idea of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy has been around in the bodybuilding circles for decades. A lot of it came from the observation that bodybuilders often have much larger muscles than powerlifters, but they aren't necessarily stronger pound for pound. That led to the popular belief that bodybuilders were growing non-functional size, meaning their muscles were filled with more fluid, enzymes, metabolites, or other non-contractile components instead of actual contractile proteins. In simple terms, sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is the idea that the sarcoplasm, which is the fluid-filled, non-force generating material inside the muscle fiber, expands more than the actual myofibrils, which are those structures responsible for force production. Now, back to the paper that set a lot of this discussion in motion. The 2019 paper by Horn and colleagues was actually a follow-up analysis of a much larger study from earlier in 2017 by the same group of researchers. And in that original study, the group as a whole did not experience increases in muscle fiber size, despite training volumes that were far beyond what most people would ever attempt. I'll get to those training crazy details later. Now, the 2019 paper identified a small subset of individuals termed responders based on the author's definition from the original study on weight supplementation and analyzed their muscle tissue in depth. That led to the conclusion that the hypertrophy they experienced was mostly driven by sarcoplasmic expansion. But because this subset only included those who appeared to grow and excluded those who appeared not to grow, we need to look very carefully at what these findings actually mean. So today I'm going to do exactly that. I'm going to break down both the horn studies, walk through the detailed methods and results, and then talk about how the broader literature interprets sarcoplasmic hypertrophy, including an excellent 2020 review that actually cautions against overgeneralizing these findings. So let's get into it. To understand the 2019 sarcoplasmic hypertrophy paper, we have to go back to the earlier study, the one that supplied the subjects in the training program. The 2017 study involved trained young men completing six weeks of extremely high volume resistance training. Now, when I say high volume, I mean extreme. So week after week, the total number of sets climbed to levels far exceeding typical bodybuilding programs, let alone evidence-based recommendations. The participants were doing 12 sets of 10 reps on the squat exercise by the end of the study. It was a very interesting paper. Now, despite this, when the researchers measured muscle fiber cross-sectional area, they found no group level differences. In other words, as a whole, the participants did not grow. Some individuals appeared to increase in size, some appeared to decrease, and many stayed roughly the same. Now, in my opinion, I think a control group would have been helpful here to know whether or not these differences were not in part due to measurement error and variation. Anyway, fast forward to 2019. Horn and colleagues returned to that same data set and decided to focus only on the individuals who appeared to experience increases in muscle fiber size. These subjects were labeled responders. This subset included just 15 of the original 31 participants. The researchers performed an in-depth muscle biopsy analysis on those responders, examining their contractile protein concentrations, enzyme content, glycogen levels, and a bunch more. Now, their goal was to understand what type of hypertrophy the responders experienced and whether it reflected true myofibrillar growth or an expansion of the sarcoplasm. So now that the background's out of the way, let's take a look at how they actually did this. 
So in the original 2017 study, 31 resistance trained young men completed a six week extremely high volume training program. These participants were already accustomed to lifting weights, but the volume they were asked to perform during this intervention was far beyond traditional bodybuilding and strength training programs. The sessions were held three days per week and focused heavily on the lower body with exercises including the squats and a stiff legged deadlift. The training design progressively increased in the total number of sets each week, eventually reaching volumes that exceeded 30 sets per week for some of the key movements. So I'll pop the program up on the screen so that you can see just how much volume it actually was. For example, you can see here that the participants worked up to 12 sets of 10 reps, not only on the squat exercise by the end of the six week study period, but they also did a large number of sets on the barbell press, the barbell single leg deadlift and the lat pull down. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't imagine doing 12 sets of squats in a single session, let alone that number of sets across many exercises. But the intention behind the aggressive progression was to test how skeletal muscle would respond to unusually high workloads and whether such extreme training protocols could drive greater hypertrophy than more conventional programs. Now, moving to the 2019 paper, which reanalyzed this original data set, focusing only on the individuals who looked like they might have increased in their muscle fiber size, out of the entire group of 31 participants, 15 individuals demonstrated measurable increases in muscle fiber cross-sectional area, and these were labeled as responders for the secondary analysis. Muscle biopsies taken from the vastus lateralis before and after the training period were then used for all of the tissue level analysis. From these biopsies, the researchers measured a wide array of molecular and structural markers to determine what type of hypertrophy had occurred. They quantified the concentrations of the major contractile proteins, actin and myosin, as well as the levels of various sarcoplasmic proteins and glycolytic enzymes. They also assessed muscle glycogen and measured citrate synthase activity as an indirect marker of mitochondrial content. Along with these biochemical measures, the study also included muscle fiber cross-sectional area assessments to confirm whether muscle fiber size had increased in this subset of participants. Together, these methods allowed the authors to compare changes in muscle size with changes in both contractile and non-contractile components of the muscle fiber, and ultimately to propose whether the observed hypertrophy was primarily myofibrillar or sarcoplasmic in nature. Now, before we dive into the results, if you're ready to train smarter, not harder, check out my evidence-based training programs. They're designed for all experience levels with unique muscle building focuses, built-in volume tracking, and exercise demonstrations. And for just $12.99, you honestly can't go wrong. To download your next training program, visit beer-body.com or you can check out my fitness app getbeafit.com to start your evidence-based training program today. Now let's get back to the video. So these results need to be interpreted in two layers. First, from the original 2017 study, when all 31 participants were analyzed together, there was no statistically significant increase in muscle fiber cross-sectional area. Some individuals appeared to grow, some appeared not to grow, and the average change was not significant. And that's a crucial starting point. Now, focusing on the 15 responders later analyzed in 2019, the researchers did observe increases in muscle fiber size. However, when they looked at the concentrations of contractile proteins within these fibers, both actin and myosin actually trended downwards. These decreases did not reach conventional levels of statistical significance, but the p-values for actin and myosin were very close, with 0.055 and 0.052 respectively. At the same time, markers of sarcoplasmic content increased. Several glycolytic enzymes rose substantially, while citrate synthase actively decreased, suggesting a reduction in mitochondrial density and function. The combination of increased fiber size in these participants, but lower contractile protein concentration led the authors to propose that the hypertrophy in these individuals was largely sarcoplasmic. And this is the conclusion that received so much attention online. But to understand what it actually means, we have to zoom out. 
The idea that most of the hypertrophy observed in these responders could be explained by sarcoplasmic expansion is intriguing, but the conclusion must be interpreted with care. First, as highlighted in a 2020 scoping review by Jorgensen and colleagues, the 2019 paper only looked at individuals where described as responders for hypertrophy according to the authors. It excluded more than half of the participants from the original study. When all participants were analysed together, the extreme volume training did not induce muscle fibre growth. That means we cannot generalise the biochemical patterns observed broadly. In addition, the broader literature strongly supports the idea that muscle fibre growth is accompanied by proportional increases in contractile components. Jorgensen and colleagues emphasised that across many longitudinal studies, something called specific tension, which reflects force production per cross-sectional area, remains stable when muscle fibres grow. Now, if sarcoplasmic hypertrophy were the primary driver of muscle growth, we would expect to see specific tension start to decline because the added size would not correspond to added contractile power. But that pattern is not commonly observed when muscle fibre size increases. So while the 2019 study provides interesting molecular data, it does not overturn decades of research showing that myofibrillar hypertrophy is the primary mechanism through which resistance training increases muscle size. It does, however, provide interesting data, which I hope the authors continue to pursue with additional studies. Now, what does this data mean for you? Well, for most people, the main takeaway is that sarcoplasmic hypertrophy may occur under certain circumstances, particularly during very high volume training, but it does not appear to be the dominant driver of long-term muscle growth in most scenarios. The 2019 study is valuable because it explores what might be happening in those rare situations where training volume is pushed to an extreme and where some individuals do respond differently. And honestly, I cannot imagine performing these kinds of volumes in a training session. The most I've ever done was five sets on a few select exercises during one of my most aggressive builds in 2020. And I was definitely walking around feeling like a watermelon. Nevertheless, these findings are not evidence that most training programs produce large amounts of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. Nor is it evidence that this type of hypertrophy is undesirable or unproductive. Also, I think we need to be careful about making the statement that higher volume training will result in sarcoplasmic hypertrophy. We need larger studies with non-exercise control conditions to make such confident claims. For example, it is also entirely possible that the responders analysed in the sarcoplasmic follow-up paper largely represented what could just be the upper era of the measurement for muscle growth. Also, did this group include a few individuals who had high levels of muscle damage? These results simply reflect one potential adaptation in a very specific, at least select subset of individuals during an unusually demanding training protocol. But there is certainly no consensus on this really interesting hypothesis. So to wrap up, the idea of sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is certainly a fascinating one, but the evidence supporting it is far more limited than many online discussions suggest. The 2019 study that sparked much of this interest analyzed only the individuals who grew during an extreme volume protocol meaning these findings cannot be generalised to the broader population. When viewed alongside the larger 2017 data set and the broader research literature, it becomes clear that most hypertrophy is still driven by increases in contractile proteins, not just the expansion of the sarcoplasm. But it opens the door for the possibility of disproportional sarcoplasmic hypertrophy in certain training circumstances. Well, everybody, thank you so much for watching. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this topic. Do you think sarcoplasmic hypertrophy plays a meaningful role in certain types of high volume training? Or is it more of a short term response that's been exaggerated online? Feel free to drop your comments below. Now, if you enjoyed this study breakdown and want to keep learning more about exercise and nutrition science, please make sure to like this video, subscribe to my channel, share it with your lifting friends, and I'll see you in my next video.